Dear ladies and gentlemen, Pani Tapanova, we are back with our series of conversations and interviews with intellectuals in Ukraine for you, our listeners, who are keen to learn more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. І ми повертаємося до історії розмов та інтерв'ю із інтелектуалами в Україні та світу. Для вас, наші слухачі, які прагнуть дізнатися більше, думати глибше та чути з перших джерел. This is a project of Fan Ukraine, and you already know that its entire team stays in Ukraine, fighting their most meaningful battle for their lives and for the freedom of expression. Це проєкт Пан Україна, і ви вже знаєте, що вся його команда залишається в Україні та веде свою найбільш значиму боротьбу за власне життя та за свободу слова. The project is co-hosted by Pan International, which has continued to provide a platform for freedom of expression for those currently under the highest risk. We work under the PEN International Charter. Співорганізатором проєкту є міжнародний PEN, який продовжує надавати платформу для свободи вираження поглядів для тих, хто перебуває у групі найвищого ризику. Ми дотримуємося хартії міжнародного PEN. The event is organized with the kind support of Knigolov Publisher. Thank you guys and personally to Olya Vishnya for your help. And our partners for today are traditionally PEN America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, Knehalov, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. We are streaming today's event to all partners' Facebook pages. Цей захід організовано за підтримки видавництва Knehalov. Дякуємо вам та особисто Олі Вишній за допомогу організації заходу. Сьогодні нашими партнерами є традиційно Pen America, Український інститут, Український інститут Лондона, Ukraine World, Книголав, Український науково-дослідний інститут Гарвардського університету та інститут Гаррімана при Колумбійському університеті. Ми транслюємо сьогоднішню подію на усі партнерські сторінки у Facebook. Захід відбуватиметься англійською мовою. Our speakers for today will touch the topic from the very fresh but painfully actual angle, the experience of survivance. Today's guests are Irana Karpa, Ukrainian writer, journalist, lead singer of the alternative band and a very active cultural actor and public figure. As a musician, writer and political activist, Irena takes active part in cultural and political events. Nowadays, Irena actively engages in volunteering activities together with acting on the level of cultural diplomacy. And Irena will hold her conversation with another legend, Dr. Edith Eva Eger, a survivor of Auschwitz who published her New York Times best-selling memoir, The Choice, at the age of 90 in 2017. In 2020, during COVID lockdown, when we were all bored, and at the age of 93, she published her internationally best-selling guidebook, The Gift. And both books are translated into more than 30 languages. Dr. Egger is a pra- practicing and word new psychologist a great grandmother to seven, and the embodiment of light heart, love, and positive energy. Welcome today. And today we will have one more person in our trialogue, basically, not dialogue, Dr. Marian Egger Angel, a clinical and sports psychologist who specialized in children, families, and sports teams. She's co-author with her mother, Dr. Edith, and will help to hold our conversation today. Dear ladies, stage is yours. Let's start from the short updates from Ukraine from Irena and then develop our conversation. Thank you so much. Thank Irena. you so much, Olha. Uh, it's I'm so happy to see you again, Dr. Eger. It's so, so happy to meet you, Dr. Angel. Um, one year ago, when, when we were presenting your book, uh, your choice on the um, book arsenal in Kyiv, no one could even dream like in the worst dreams that actually now we would be going through this full scale war. The Ukrainian people is fighting like a lion. People are really, that's amazing because there is a huge amount of solidarity, courage and um, readiness to fight until the end for their land. Um, in the meantime, there are lots of people who are fleeing Ukraine, especially women with children, because many women stay, they decide to stay in Ukraine to fight together with men. Um, the most of women are doing lots of volunteering jobs. Everybody is sure we will win. 
so I'm, I'm very, very proud at this moment of every um, woman, man, child who are there. I think you, you're like, you're, you should know what's going on in Ukraine. So no need to explain to you and no need to explain to Ukrainians, of course. And we are very happy to see world solidarity towards us. I mean, the world sees that we are on the right side and our fight is the fight of, of people who just try to protect their own land like real fighter he fights not because he hates that something that's in front of him just because he loves that something in the back and uh, being prepared for, for, to be prepared for this interview i put the questions uh, i said like look at this uh, chance that we have uh, to talk directly to edit egger because people loved your book even before it all started and i had a huge amount i don't know if you see this all these questions people started uh, posing and like lots of them said like don't ask anything just tell her a very big thank you because her book saved my life my life of uh, life of my children and helped me to to make a right choice when i was asking myself should i leave the city or not and another young woman this is the woman i know she's a young writer herself uh, another woman, she said, um, Dr. Egger's book was the only one book I took with me when I was living with the little backpack. So you should thank her for this book. So can you just imagine how important it is and how we all are inspired in this very difficult times? And of course I have, I have, so technically my interview will be composed by questions asked by these women who are inside this war or who left Ukraine for the moment and they feel guilty. They have this uh, syndrome of survivor, survivor guilt and people who are traumatized and people who try not to lose hope and not to lose um, the taste of life. So I would really like to, to transfer you their questions. Um, so um, lots of them are asking about uh, the hatred or possibility uh, to forgive. So like to hate or to forgive. Um, for example, how can you forgive someone who's trying to destroy your people? Did you manage to forgive those who destroyed, who destroyed your people, who tried to destroy your people? I don't have any godly power. My daughter actually reminded me of that, that I not really cannot forgive anyone except I have the choice whether I allow the enemy to get to me and not to really practice what I was made to be. So I think the best we can do is not to carry the past with us or the enemy with us because it will actually give more power. So what I learned in Auschwitz that I could not change the external circumstance, but it was a place for discovery. And I believe that this is the discovery for the people in Ukraine how they can truly find their true self, their true self, that they're not going to be victims of anything or anyone. So I am so happy to call you a Renaissance woman because you are a musician and you are a writer and I don't know what else you are, but I see a piano and I wish you could play a little piano. Do we have time? <laughs> It's my husband who's playing, so I, I think I will spare you my, my play. I'm playing bass guitar, that's the only thing. But you're totally right about rediscovering of our inner selves. For me, I think it's a very strong moment of, of identification for every Ukrainian and for being united. So uh, unfortunately, it's thanks to this aggression that people understood once again how strong they can be and how unique. And so my readers also ask you, what do you feel towards Germans nowadays and how to learn not to hate during the war? I can tell you that the 12 years of Hitler rights does not make all Germans Nazis. Sometimes we generalize. I knew a woman, it was in the New York Times a while ago, was on her deathbed and they asked her, why did she risk her life to save Jewish lives? And her answer was, 
My father told me that was the right thing to do. So I am looking in Germany. I love the Wiener Schnitzel, of course, and I love the Napoleon Austrian. Switzerland, <laughs> which I did. Um, but I think it's very important for us to recognize that your people many times were the parents, grandparents of my parents. And I know that we have been, we have been uh, in many, many places. I, I know that the Jewish people were slaves, and then they were walking with Moses over 40 years, and they never gave up. So you and I carry that love, the, that, uh, and I know that many of the Jews come from the Ukraines. Their ancestors were in, in the Ukraine. So we are sisters and brothers, and that's really my dream, just like Martin Luther King, that someday we're going to hold hand in hand and form a human family. So you can be you and I can be mine, but I don't have the power really to do anything with anyone. And I know that whatever you do, you never regret. We regret what we don't do. Yes, that's for sure. And how, how do you learn now not to hate during the war? So there's lots of hatred. And unfortunately, sometimes it's not only against the enemy, but against the people who are close to you. Because this is, I think, the main problem during the war. Many people chose many things in many ways, but I know that we didn't know what will happen four o'clock in the morning. We didn't know whether we end up in a, in a gas chamber, just like now. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I also know that many people gave up and died without any physiological reasons. And today I beg parents not to spoil the children because spoiled children don't master things on their own and they end up giving up much quicker. My daughter is also a sports psychologist, so you may want to adv take advantage of that as well, I hope. But my daughter tells me that uh, being a survivor's child she was two years old, she was parentized because these children grow up very fast. They teach their parents how to speak English. She taught me how to eat peanut butter and, and tuna fish. I've never seen that in Hungary ever. So I think it's very good to get all the generations together and see how we can empower each other with our differences. I'd like to say something here. Sure. Um, you've asked some really wonderful questions about families and the fighting that's probably going on within families mm -hmm. who have different opinions, because families always have different opinions, right? But now the opinions are life and death. And um, I can only imagine what it's like for all these women who've left the country, who feel safe where they are, but they feel guilty and they're scared and yes. they're worried. Extremely and they also don't know what, and they don't know what to do next. And what if they can't go back home, then where do they go? Nobody planned on being an immigrant, like my mother. I mean, my mother and father escaped uh, after they, the communists tried to kill my father. Um, and that's a whole story in itself. So, you know, these are very painful, difficult, scary times. And all these things that we have loved with our, the people we love, with the people we know. I mean, I've been to the Ukraine. So many people there know Russians if they're not even or related to them. And, and I know that the, not all the Russians know the truth of what's happening. So there is so much happening now that is so painfully difficult to understand. And I think it will take years before there's there's a calm that can happen within the families. And that is, 
it's sad, right? It, it, it's a loss. And to try to find how to go forward, because as my mother always says, you can't go backwards. Life is always forward. And, um, and, and somehow all these difficulties that people are experiencing and, you know, when you feel one thing and other people in the family feel something else, a lot of us want to be right. So whether or not it matters if you're right or wrong, we still want to be right. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that love will come back in the same way. And sometimes we have to just accept that there are differences and try to find ways to either move forward or sometimes not. But it's th this is a very painful time. Mm, thank you. Yes, but like speaking of love, some questions were really touching, you know, like they were not about war, but they were like, should I believe in love? So like for me, it's 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 so sweet that people actually think about these things nowadays. And I was also quoting you, uh, dear Dr. Eger, yesterday. Um, this like for me, it's a very powerful saying of yours. The victim thinks, why did it happen to me? The survivor thinks, what can I do with it? And people reacted very strongly. So my next couple of questions will be about this state of mind of a victim how to get rid of it, how to go out of it. And the next one, probably immediately, how to, how to get back the wish um, uh, or the capability to create if this wish and capability to create disappeared with the beginning of the war. I, I hope I can send this to you. I wrote this uh, a while ago, the difference between a victim and a survivor, mm -hmm. the, the victims are flexible. The rigidity is many times that Marianne said it so well that people want to be right, but I can only be right for me. I cannot be right for anyone else. So I think it's very important um, not to judge other people and uh, just recognize yes. that we have two ears and one mouth so we would talk less and listen more. <laughs> I, I have become, with my age, a very compassionate listener, and I think it very important. And find your true self, because your genuine self usually were given up in the family. See, if you're a firstborn child, and if you marry another firstborn child, Sometimes you have a power struggle. My daughter doesn't. Her husband is a Nobel Prize winner. I think they do not ever compete with each other. They don't dominate or compete, but cooperate. So I think it's good for you to uh, recognize these are very difficult times, but no one can replace you. The only one you're going to have for a lifetime is you. All other relationships will end. So I hope you get up in the morning and say, Ola, I love you. And self-love is self-care. It's not narcissistic. I say that a million times a day. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, you asked the question, about, about yes, creativity, but we can also ask about sports. For me, I, I didn't manage to do sports even one single time. It's horrible. And I think it's, but I know that you feel so much better after you exercise or you create. So how can we come back this power to create or to do sports? So please tell us you should know better than anyone else. <laughs> well, for you to talk about stunted creativity. <laughs> Creativity happens with our bodies. It happens with our minds. It happens with our feelings. And the more that we are frightened, the more that we are angry, creativity doesn't have a space there. So, you know, exercising is something you can do in your bed before you get up, you know, just do a few things you know how to do, a few, you know, a few stretches or whatever. Anything that you do that stretches your body, that moves your body, yeah, right, any of these things, right, lift your legs up, 
um, in your neck, yes, yeah. you know, um, stand up, touch your toes. These are tiny little things, but in fact, the effect on your brain and on your muscle functioning and on your um, uh, breathing, uh, on your heart rate, it's phenomenal. And you, if you did this five minutes a day, five minutes a day, two minutes when you wake up, two minutes when you go to sleep, you will feel better. But the other thing I want to say is about creativity of the mind. Probably everybody listening to this podcast is having an experience right now. I know that we Americans are dying every day with you. It's so painful. Don't forget it. Write it down. Don't forget these moments because when it's the time has passed, your mind is naturally going to want to push it away, as it probably should. But if you can write things down now so that later the next generation can even read it. And it doesn't have to be important. It's just how you feel or something that happened. But if you can do this, and I'm talking to everybody listening, do something to mark this time. This is a very important time for the world. Don't let us forget it. You know, many people told me many years to write a book, and automatically I would say, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. And then Philip Zimpardo called me one time and said, Edie, the people who survived, and they are famous, are all men. We need a female voice. And that's how the choice is the female voice of Viktor Frankl. But Viktor Frankl was a medical doctor in his 30s, and uh, he was uh, telling me when we got together that he was imagining himself after the war lecturing about the concentration camp in Vienna. And I said, I also closed my eyes, and I imagined that I, I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet, and the music was Tchaikovsky, and I was at the Budapest Opera House talking to very elegant, elegant people. So I think it's very important to, to also tell you that my mother in a cattle car held me and said, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put in your mind. I think it's good to read the, uh, not to to see the movie called The Karate Kid, because it talks about what Marian talks about the power of your mind. Thank, Thank you, you Marian. That was beautiful. Thank you. Yes, and um, yeah. So for our viewers and listeners, you shouldn't feel guilty if you do something for your creativity, no. for your sports. If you listen to beautiful things, if you see beautiful things. You shouldn't be guilty because I think this guilt is part of the survivor's guilt. And this is something that many people fight against now. So I, I got a PhD in survivor's guilt, but guilt is in the past and worry is in the future. And the only thing we have in charge is the present. That's why we call it the present, right? It is the only thing is that we control of in the present. In a concentration camp, we talked about food. Only thing we talked about is food. How much paprika you put in a Hungarian goulash. And, and we were just salivating. And we were thinking of, when I get out of here, never ever imagining that I'm going to stay there. And thank God, you know, I'm here talking to you. They find hope in hopelessness to find a way to not allow yourself to anyone to get to you without your permission or allowing them. So I think it was very important then, and it's very important now that I am lucky enough to talk to over 100,000 Ukrainians. And that's what my precious uh, person tells me, my right-hand person. Katie, Katie, Katie is here. 
Show yourself, Katie. Girl. Please. She's Hi. the one. Hello. She, she's Hello, the one. Hello, Ukraine. She Hi. arranges everything time wise so I can be with you. Katie does morning. everything. We, uh, it's important. I totally understand the importance. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one more question, which is like, I think it's a pretty painful one. Uh, what can you do when you understand the tragedies going on? You understand it with your mind, but you cannot feel anything. What is this phenomenon? What can people yeah. do with it? People, people tell tells me, how did I feel? I was void of feelings. I was numb. I never cried in Auschwitz. Uh, it was hell. We didn't know what will happen when it took a shower, whether gas or water is coming. So we are in a very difficult time, and we were not prepared for it. We were put in a place we were not prepared for. And many times we are told one thing and we found another. So I think it's very, very important to not allow anything or anyone to change your mind that it is something I don't like, it's inconvenient, and it's temporary. Not a, yes, but. Get rid of the but. I don't know if your mom told you sometimes that you're a beautiful girl, but you're fat or pimply, I don't know. Yes, yes. but. We'll cancel everything before the but. Yes, and we're here now, and the only thing I can change is the present. The past is gone. There is no way I can ever change the past. I'd like to say it's okay. I'd like to say something quickly. You know, being numb, emotionally mm -hmm. numb, at a time like this, sometimes is protective. Because if you begin to feel all the things you're feeling, you might not be able to do the things that need to be done. And um, very true. And it's very, it's very painful, especially if you're a mother and you have children. They don't want to see you numb. So mm -hmm. if you can try to just be numb to yourself, but take care of them. Um, you know, I think that balance is is the thing that works so well. I think the reason I'm such a healthy person is that while my mother was still being numb, she took very good care of me. And that's what I urge all of you who are listening, who feel numb in your own emotions, perfectly normal. But take good care of the people you need to take care of. Yes, exactly. So this is my first saying to all those moms who took away their kids from these places which are being destroyed right now. You did the right thing. You did the number one thing. You should not feel guilty whatsoever. And talking about present, uh, another question is, what can you do in present time Mm, for um, not to suffer too much of uh, this post-traumatic syndrome when the war is over? Is there any rule? Is, uh, is there any way to protect like some psychological hygiene to, you know, like just to be, uh, to, um, to make it softer later, if it's possible? I think what mothers do are two things. We either ask questions or we give advice. I want you to stop asking, how are you? It's a very stupid question. I used to ask my patients, how are you? And they tell me, fine. And I knew that they were suicidal. So the next time I said, geez, good to see you. I missed you. So think before you say anything, whether it's necessary, whether it's important. But most of all, is it kind? kind mm -hmm. is it kind and if it's not don't say it i i practice that a lot of the times especially when i'm in my daughter's home and she fixed a beautiful uh, gourmet dinner and i may want to say something and i'm thinking to myself you know is it important and i stop myself and I say, no, just sit still and enjoy the meal and uh, don't interrupt anybody's conversation. You know, at 94, I'm talking to myself much more 
and it's very, very useful. Mm. So I think what you're asking also is how to protect yourself from the PTSD that we know is mm. coming. Yes. You know, um, well, if you do what I told you <laughs> about a little exercise, a little joy every day, teensy tiny bits, that will help you. If you take notes so that you don't have to remember on a daily basis because you have it on a piece of paper, you'd be amazed at how freeing that is. Because one of the things about PTSD is you don't want to forget because it meant so much to you. So if you have it on paper, you can put it somewhere else. So when you need to remember, you can go read it. Um, you know, some of the PTSD is just normal and natural. And I think we have to, in some ways, embrace it as a way that we can remember what we went through, why it happened, and what we can do in the future, and what kind of support we give to different systems in the world and to our children and to um, democracy, I mean, to be, you know, and, and for people to be able to get true information and all these kinds of things that will help everyone's PTSD if they feel that it can be avoided again in the future with, you know, different behaviors. But it is, it is there and to pretend that it's not I Is also want to tell you that post-traumatic stress disorder, it's not really a disorder, it's a reaction to a loss. It's grief. And you got to grieve because you cannot heal what you don't feel. So don't medicate grief. I teach at the medical school and a wonderful third year uh, uh, residents talk more now before they put the drugs. And think it's very important because what comes out of your body doesn't make you ill, what stays in there does. I didn't tell anyone I was in Auschwitz close to 20 years. And my husband was the one who told my daughter when she was 16, when I 12. bought her a beautiful silk dress, mm -hmm. an orange, a beautiful dress, and he said, go have fun, my darling. Your, when your mother was in your age, she was in Auschwitz. I thought I was going to kill my husband. How can you talk to my daughter this way? And uh, I think it was very important. Uh, today, I would not do that. You know, if you have a secret, share it, get it out. It's not your fault. You didn't do anything to deserve that. We never did, really. I'm sure when you were, you were leaving your country, you cried, you cried, and you may not know how difficult it is for your body to leave your your bed, the curtains, the familiar surroundings. But there is no going back. There is only a new beginning. Yes. Well, I'm on that lucky side. It's been six years that I live in Paris, but right now I'm hosting Ukrainian refugees and all my friends are hosting Ukrainian refugees, people who really left their lives behind, left everything they have, they have really big difficulties how to protect their children, how to explain the war to children, not to traumatize them too much. And no matter how hard they try, kids, they like, they, they play illegal, they make shelters, bomb shelters, or they do guns, or he sees the bottle of wine in my kitchen, the little boy, and he says, look, it's Molotov's cocktail. So anyway, uh -huh. unfortunately, the war is there, it's in wow. their minds. And my question is, about uh, those like for us who actually who didn't see the war directly and maybe also we feel so powerless because we see it somewhere what's happening in Mariupol yeah. we cannot help directly we feel this is like the worst suffering I think that you cannot interfere immediately you can talk about it you can do volunteering you cannot interfere directly but then you meet people who saw the war who suffered and we want really to find the best way to support them 
what can you suggest on this matter? How can we support people who come from the health and who we want to help here when it's safe physically? I remember when my little girl came home and she cried because she wasn't invited to a birthday party and I had no idea what it means to have empathy, to listen to the child. I, I minimized it. These are the defense mechanism. We, you know, just forget about it, honey. I just baked a Hungarian chocolate cake and food was the answer for everything. I took her to the kitchen and I said, I'm gonna make you a chocolate milkshake. And, and so I think if you can just repeat what you hear from the child so they know that they are being heard you meet them where they are, but treat them as if they were what they're capable of becoming. And they rise to the occasion. I think the question that I ask, it's very important. When did your childhood end? And if you're a child of an immigrant, you taught your parents how to speak English. You taught your parents many of the foods that, that uh, America has, you know, peanut butter and tuna fish. But uh, I think it's very important to find that child in you because that child may be crying. I need a good parent and you show up. I want to say a few things about yes. children because that's actually one of my specialties. She's a child psychologist. You know, children can adapt to anything if they feel that they are cared safe. for and listened to and safe. safe. And so what I'd like to urge people to do is take the children to the park, take a ball with you, do, do things that feel normal and natural, but also sit and talk to them. And, you know, how are you feeling? What's going on? Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm so... I'm so affected by that little boy who said to you a Molotov cocktail when he saw wine. Yeah. You know, um, I don't even know if he even knows what a Molotov cocktail is and what you do with it. Um, but if they're making guns, you know, first of all, all kids make guns all over the world, but this is a different yeah. kind of situation. And and I think, I think one of the things to say, well, to ask them what they feel, what they, what they're thinking about, and then say, you know, the great thing right now is we are safe. We are safe and our country will be safe again. But right now you're safe and I'm safe with you. And aren't, isn't it great that we have friends who help keep us uh, safe and mm -hmm. safety to children is kind of everything. I think I'm repeating the same phrase to adults, to those brave women who actually made an effort that took sometimes like five days or one week to go from Ukraine to here. I can and only I, imagine. I keep yes. repeating that main thing, you are safe. Main, just like they are so incredible and they say, oh my God, I don't want to stay here. I want to go home because I don't want to be a burden and I, I want my job back and so on. And so they cannot really find the peace and I'm trying and everybody is trying to find a way to support them, like how to, how to make them, how to make them comfortable. So like, I, well, I'm, but I think I'm so happy that you guys are safe. Like this is the main thing, like everything else will get it back. I think, I think the thing to address with them is the sense. And I think my mother talked about it, about the sense of loss. And, and that the fear of abandonment. Well, but you know, they, they have lost their jobs. They've lost their house. Their husbands may be there fighting. Yes. My, you know, one of my best friends, she left, she lost her, her man a couple of oh days ago. And I don't find words what to do, what to, how to help her. Like what can there are I do? no words. Of course, you know what you can do. You, you just be there and hug her and, and tell her how sorry you are. Right. Hmm. Yeah. You know, that this is. She's in Ukraine still? Yes, yeah, she's in Ukraine still. She doesn't leave. Yes. She stayed for him. Though. No. And never say, I know how you feel. Because no, you don't know. I don't even suspect. No, I would never say that. No. But everyone wants to be heard and everyone wants to be understood. And right now is one day. But in three months, 
she's also going to need that. Mm. Yeah. And time doesn't change. It's what you do with the time. That's important. It's in my book, so. Yes, yes. <laughs> anything I book. see, I, anything I see, I, I, I lived. And I'm very grateful to you how committed you are. Just remember that we're not limitless. We're limited. It takes courage just to be average. It, in it, it really does take courage not to make an A plus all the time. And, and, you know, I didn't know statistics. I still don't know statistics. I, I called my supervisor Hitler and I hired people to help me to pass the statistics so I can become a licensed clinical psychologist. Oh, thank you so much. It feels such a like feels like luxury to talk about this moment we know from your book and to see you, Dr. Angels. Well, we know you from from your book and, and it's it's so great. Thank you for those moments. I can see Olha who wants to who wants to ask us some more questions. Thank you so much. It's such a it's such a relief to talk to you and for, for all of us, for all of your readers, for all of the viewers. Thank you for your time. It's very precious. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for your very good questions. Thank you for your hard work and give my love to everyone. Yes, for this, sure. This too yes. shall pass. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple of questions from our listeners. For example, one quite harsh. If there's anything you could have said to any aggressor anywhere in the world in the past and in the present time, what would those words be? If there are any words you could say to an oppressor, an oppressor, Hitler. Yeah. I, uh, Putin. Putin. Yeah. I think Putin yeah. is what we're yeah. talking about here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How would you like to be remembered? Would you like to be remembered as someone who can love? How can you be remembered as someone who changed the world to a better place that we can combine each other and form a human family? I, I would like to talk about, since I'm 94 years old, how I want to be remembered. I want to be remembered as an ambassador for peace and goodwill. And so I would... Uh, always remember myself i wanted to go and find dr mengele and talk to him when i danced for him and i would tell him that i'm the girl that i followed my mother in auschwitz to the gas chamber and you grabbed me and threw me on the other side and told me that i'm gonna see my mother very soon she's just gonna take a shower and so i I, I like to see everyone to look for not yes, but, but yes, and, and, and life is difficult. Look at your birth certificate. It doesn't say there is a guarantee or certainty, but there is a probability that if you are more congruent, the more you, you understand things about anything, that life is complicated and there are no simple answers, but you can be a good parent to you because children don't do what we say, they do what they see. The best thing for a child is your and your husband be smooching and be happy and that's what the children hopefully can see in your home. Uh, be an example. That's so true. And we have another question, which is quite complicated. To which extent you bear living in the land and with the people who committed such atrocities in Auschwitz? And can you forgive and forget that? No, as I said to me, forgiveness is I'm forgiving myself that I'm not going to carry anything that I, I changed even in Auschwitz, that I didn't hate, I had pity. I had pity 
that these people were brainwashed and they're wearing a uniform. And I, I did not hate, really. I just felt sorry for them. How can anyone do anything like that? 15, 15 highly educated people decided at the end of the day that they can put 30,000 Jewish people in the oven. So they were celebrating, actually, when they uh, find a scientific and a systematic uh, solution. So I think it's very important for me to tell the children that I have no time to hate, because if I would live in hate, I would still be a prisoner. Yeah, this is a very strong position. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Edith and yeah. Dr. Marian for this powerful female voice of surveillance and love, so full of freedom and forgiveness. And probably for the most important advice for all those mothers asking themselves what they should do, how to keep taking care, how to protect yourself and your closest people from PTSD. And for all those emotional tips and quite simple but highly effective exercises, Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Irena, for your questions, for your personal experience and your strong position. Please I carry like on. To, I like to tell you that today I have three children, five grandchildren and seven great grandsons. And that's my revenge to Hitler. This is the best revenge ever. Yeah, so yeah. what we all Trouble. can take from yeah. these conversations is usually deeper understanding and some answers about what can I do to help, including help yourself. And today I would say, be a human, be there, listen. Show up, yeah. yes, show up. Thank you show for up. showing up, thank you. Thank you. We are grateful to our partners for today's event. First of all, Kniholav and Ole Vushnia who made this possible, Pan America, Ukrainian Institute, Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, and for all the cross-streaming service in all the partners' pages. Gratitude, of course, to Pan Ukraine, which continues to stand at the broad lines in the name of freedom and truth. Pan International is proud to be a platform that supports freedom of expression. Please follow our page to be informed about further events over the next week. The next episode will be broadcast tomorrow on Wednesday, 4 p.m. Kiev time, 2 p.m. London time. Alexander Mehad, writer, curator of art project and literary scholar, will talk to Vital Chablowski, an award-winning Polish journalist and reporter. Thank you one more time, our great speakers. Thank you, our listeners and viewers follow our dialogues, spread the word, and stand with Ukraine. This is our shared responsibility today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.